The photograph that appears behind me is a representation of a gross miscarriage of justice. A young girl was found murdered and violated in the basement of a pencil factory in Atlanta, Georgia in April 1913. The manager, a soft-spoken intellectual, stood accused of the crime, yet only circumstantial and hearsay evidence ever came to light that the prosecution utilized to convict him. The prosecuting attorney in this case, a local political ideologue, looked for something to propel him to a higher office, and this case was that vehicle. The only person that became somewhat of a saving grace to the accused murderer ruined his political career and faced serious death threats for reinvestigating the circumstances as to how a seemingly innocent man got convicted of a crime that most people say he didn't commit. nineteen thirteen atlanta the city grew steadily since the end of reconstruction when the city fathers decided to rely on manufacturing instead of the centuries-old staple of agriculture with the declining price of cotton a growing economy and the need to fill jobs many people left country living for the life in the big city in turn housing in the major metropolitan area barely accommodated those who lived in primitive conditions a thriving metropolis that was just 40 years removed from the Civil War. Beneath the surface of the city's conscience, Atlanta still held on to the racial animus that prevailed in the Reconstruction South. Although the citizenry held close to firmly held beliefs of white supremacy, the Jewish population of the state of Georgia felt no fear as prejudice toward blacks was tantamount to any other race. The only dislike that whites held toward Jews in Atlanta stemmed from the ownership of businesses where they employed children. Child labor laws had not yet passed nationally, but the utilization of children in manual labor stayed on the minds of parents and those advocates of children who worked to give their greatest resource back their childhood. It was in this atmosphere that the rule of law would be tested and the conscience of a nation bled with sympathy and hatred at the same time. At approximately 3 a.m., on the morning of April 27, 1913, the night watchman for the National Pencil Factory, Newt Lee, ventured down to the basement of the factory to use the bathroom. After leaving the bathroom, Lee walked to the back of the basement and discovered the body of a young girl near the incinerator. Lee noticed that the young girl's dress had been rolled up around her waist and a piece of her petticoat torn off and left around her neck, apparently used to strangle the girl. Lee also noticed that the girl's face was blackened and scratched up, her head battered and bruised. A seven-foot strip of quarter-inch wrapping cord had been tied in a loop around her neck and buried very deeply into her flesh. Her underwear had been torn and stained with blood. Lee noticed that the poor girl's skin was covered with ash and dirt, signifying that the victim did not go easily. After discovering the body, Newt Lee first called the factory manager but received no answer, then called the police. When the police arrived, they noticed a service ramp at the rear of the basement led to a sliding door that opened into a back alley. This door appeared to have been jimmied to make entry easier. Police noticed a narrow trail of dirt leading from the elevator to where the little girl had been found, denoting that the body had been dragged there. The police also located bloody fingerprints on the door leading from the street into the basement. 
Two notes were left at the crime scene and appeared to have been written by an uneducated hand. He said he would love me laying down, play like the night witch did it, but that long, tall, black negro did, boy, his slept. The other letter said, Ma'am, that negro hired down here did this. I went to make water and he pushed me down that hole, a long, tall, negro black, that who it was, long, slim, tall, negro, I write while play with me. When the police read the notes out loud, Newt Lee exclaimed, quote, Boss, it looks like they're trying to lay it on me, end quote. As a result of the notes, police arrested Newt Lee. Since he reported the discovery of the body, then he must have committed the murder, which today the arrest would be considered highly suspect. And a gentleman named Arthur Molyneux, who was seen with a young girl late Saturday night before her body had been discovered. The little girl was identified as Mary Fagan, 13 years old, and an employee of the factory that the manager laid off the previous week. Eventually, police arrested two others they suspected of being responsible for the murder of little Mary Fagan, John M. Gant, a former bookkeeper for the pencil factory, and Gordon Bailey, the young black elevator operator. When police later searched the second floor of the pencil factory near the manager's office, they discovered hair and blood near a lathe and became convinced that the murder took place on the second floor and Fagan's body had been dragged to the basement. Subsequent to this discovery, the hair was proven not to be Fagan's and the blood was identified as paint. Prosecutor Hugh Dorsey chose to ignore this for the trial later. Newt Lee reiterated to police that he attempted to telephone the factory's manager, Leo Max Frank, but received no answer. Later, the police went to Frank's residence at approximately 7 a.m. that morning and requested that he accompany them back to the factory without notifying Frank of the incident that occurred. Frank acted quite agitated when confronted by the police, exhibiting nervousness, and he appeared to be very pale. Detectives brought Frank to his office to check his ledger book to identify whether Fagan worked at the factory or not. Frank stated that he did not know the girl, but that all of the employees were identified by an employee number which he kept in a ledger book for the payroll. Detectives then escorted Frank on the elevator to the basement. When the elevator reached the bottom, and when the detectives and Frank got off the elevator, a horrendous smell permeated the area. Police later discovered that someone defecated in the elevator shaft, and when the elevator came to rest, it smashed the feces creating the smell. This became an essential factor later in the case. Detectives then took Frank to the morgue to view the body of the girl, and Frank reiterated that he did not recognize her. Police returned Frank to his home at approximately 10.45 a.m. that morning and, at the time, did not consider him a suspect. On Monday, April 28, 1913, Frank, accompanied by an attorney, Luther Rosser, went to the Atlanta police station and gave a written deposition where he provided a timeline of his activities on the Saturday before Lee discovered Fagan's body. Frank stated that Fagan entered his office between 12.05 and 12.15 p.m. on that Saturday, April 26th. According to the witness, Lee arrived at 4 p.m. and Frank asked him to return as the manager did not want to be disturbed by the noisy cleaning that Lee was assigned to do. Lee was to punch into the time clock every half hour, but police noticed there were several gaps in Lee's time card. At the insistence of his lawyer, Rosser, Frank exposed his body to demonstrate he had no scratches on his body as if he were involved in a struggle, nor did his suit have the appearance of any blood. Frank wore the same suit to the deposition as he had on the day the murder allegedly took place. In a subsequent search of Frank's laundry at his residence, they found no blood there either. After giving his deposition, Frank then met with the Pinkerton detectives hired by the owners of the pencil factory to assist the police with their investigation. The detectives did investigate many leads, even the ones that may have hurt Frank. Several rumors circulated that Frank took liberties with the young female employees at the factory. The detectives investigated those as well, but found no substantiation in any of them. One of the Pinkerton detectives, Harry Scott, was to work close with one of the Atlanta police investigators, John Black. But from the minute that Black questioned Frank, he believed the factory manager to be guilty and therefore presented a conflict of interest. On April 29, 1913, 
Police arrived at Frank's residence to conduct a search. Investigators found a white shirt smeared with blood up on the armpits and the shirt appeared to have been unused. Police believed this to be a plant in Frank's residence and ridiculously believed that Frank himself had planted the shirt. On the day of the search at 11.30 a.m., police went to the American Pencil Factory and arrested Leo Max Frank for the murder of Mary Fagan. At the time of Frank's arrest, most Jewish citizens in the city believed that the police were looking for a scapegoat to the murder. Frank was born in New York City in 1884 and later attended Cornell University where he received a degree in mechanical engineering. His uncle, Moses Frank, was part owner in the pencil factory in Atlanta and felt confident that Leo had the industriousness and intelligence to run the factory efficiently. When Frank moved to Atlanta in 1910, he met and fell in love with Lucille Selig, a young woman from a prominent Jewish family, and the two soon were married. Hardworking and resourceful, Leo Frank turned the American Pencil Factory into a very profitable business. Nothing in his background denoted the type of fiendish proclivities he would later be accused of by the state of Georgia. On April 30, 1913, authorities held an inquest into the death of Mary Fagan. Frank testified at the inquest and recounted, again, the events of Saturday, April 26th. Several other witnesses came forward at the inquest and testified that Mary Fagan often complained about Frank and the way he looked at the other young females who worked at the factory. With one witness stating that factory manager flirted with some women and even propositioned another. Even with these attestations, the detectives admitted, quote, they so far have obtained no conclusive evidence or clues in the baffling mystery. End quote. But the mystery became more complicated as the investigation continued. William J. Burns of the Burns Detective Agency traveled to Atlanta to assist in the investigation, having been engaged by the owners of the pencil factory. Later in the month of May, Burns withdrew, and one of his detectives assigned to the case stated, quote, We came down to investigate a murder not engage in petty politics." End quote. Even though the inquest produced no conclusive evidence that Frank murdered Fagan, the police laid their hopes for convicting Frank on the word of a manipulative, conniving, decadent brute named Jim Conley. Conley first came to the notice of the Atlanta authorities in the Fagan case when, on May 1, 1913, someone observed him washing some red stains from a shirt in a basin at the factory. Police brought Conley into custody and later learned that the stains were rust and returned the shirt to Conley. Furthermore, someone police questioned earlier stated they witnessed a black man in dark blue clothing and a hat loitering in the lobby of the factory on the day of the murder. Investigators doubted the story Conley told and held him for an additional two weeks for further questioning. Finally, Conley related his version of what happened. Police then released Arthur Molyneux and John Gant on May 1, 1913. Connolly admitted he wrote the notes discovered at the crime scene, stating that Frank dictated what Connolly wrote. Investigators tested Connolly's handwriting between the suspect writing, quote, Night Watchman, end quote, and, quote, Night Witch, end quote. Although convinced that Connolly wrote the notes, investigators expressly doubted the rest of the story that Frank premeditated the murder and involved Conley as an accomplice. Upon questioning, Conley stated that on the day of the murder, he visited some bar rooms and shot dice and drank. At first, Conley claimed that he could neither read nor write, which police later proved false as they produced promissory notes that he signed borrowing money from another individual. Conley wrote several statements, and on the third try, he stated he lied about the Friday meeting with Frank and instead stated it was on Saturday that he met the factory manager on the street on Saturday, April 26th. Conley related that when he met Frank outside of the factory, Frank directed the suspect to follow him into the factory. Frank then told Conley to hide in a wardrobe closet because two women were coming to visit him and the manager did not want Conley exposed. Conley emphasized that Frank dictated the notes to him, gave him some cigarettes, and then instructed him to leave the factory. Conley swore he did not hear about the murder until the next day. Conley then went drinking and then to a movie. 
Pencil Company officials explained that Connolly's story was false. How did Connolly believe that a crime had not been committed when asked to write notes about it? Newspapers in Atlanta received premier coverage and ran the stories that Frank was all but guilty of the murder. Subsequently, police tried to arrange a meeting between Frank and Conley, but Frank refused to attend without his lawyer, who happened to be out of town at the time. Police deduced, rather wrongly, that Frank's refusal to meeting Conley face-to-face -face signified Frank's guilt. On May 5, 1913, coroner H. F. Harris finally conducted the autopsy on Mary Fagan's corpse. On removing the skull, I found there was no actual break of the skull, but a little hemorrhage under the skull. I think beyond any question she came to her death from strangulation from this cord being wound around her neck. I made an examination of the privates of Mary Fagan. I found no spermatozoa. On the walls of the vagina there was evidence of violence of some kind. The epithelium was pulled loose, completely detached in places, blood vessels were dilated immediately beneath the surface, and a great deal of hemorrhage in the surrounding tissues. The dilation of the blood vessels indicated to me that the injury had been made to the vagina some little time before death, perhaps 10 to 15 minutes. The fact that the child was strangled to death was indicated by the lividity the blueness of the parts, the congestion of the tongue and mouth, and the blueness of the hands and fingernails. Dr. H. F. Harris, May 1913. Also on May 5th, Frank produced an alibi character witness named Lemmy Quinn, the foreman in Fagan's area of the factory. Quinn stated that he saw Frank the Saturday of the murder a few minutes after 12.20 p.m. Quinn also stated that he knew Frank very well. He swore he was not guilty of the murder. Several additional witnesses came forward to state that they saw a young female resembling Fagan and it appeared that she had been drugged. Detectives accused Frank of bribing the witnesses to make those statements and the police discounted them. On May 9, 1913, 14-year-old Maureen Stover, an employee at the factory, stated she went to the factory that Saturday and noticed Frank not in his office at the time he related to the police. Another woman came forward and stated as she walked past the factory at approximately 4.30 p.m. on Saturday afternoon, she heard three piercing screams emanating from the building. On May 10, 1913, an ex-police officer named Robert House claimed that he once caught Frank in the woods with an underage girl engaged in, quote, immoral acts, end quote. House added that Frank begged the ex-policeman not to report the incident. House's statement could not be corroborated. Armed with the testimony of Jim Conley and the investigators considering Frank's behavior suspicious, on May 24, 1913, a grand jury formally indicted Leo Max Frank for the murder of Mary Fagan. Solicitor Dorsey strongly recommended to the grand jury not to indict Connolly. Every time press coverage increased, Conley rose to the occasion and embellished his story further. On May 29th, in another four-hour interrogation, Conley averred that Frank said to him, quote, he had picked up a girl back there and let her fall and that her head hit up against something, end quote. Conley continued that he assisted Frank in taking the girl's body to the basement via the elevator and then when they returned to Frank's office, began to compose the murder notes. Conley further related that Frank gave him $200, but later demanded it back and said he would make it up to him on Monday, quoting Frank as saying, quote, if I live and nothing happens, end quote. On June 5, 1913, the Columbus Daily Enquirer Sun reported that a black woman named Miniola McKnight, a former housekeeper of the Franks, had been arrested and gave a statement where she alleged that on the night of the homicide, Frank had been drinking and looked for a pistol with which to kill himself. No matter who came forward with the story, state solicitor Hugh Dorsey believed he had enough evidence to convict Frank of Fagan's murder. A rooming house proprietor by the name of Miss Min Fonby gave a statement to the police that a man matching Leo Frank's description tried to rent a room for he and a young girl on the night of the murder. Examining these informants, who came forward so late in the investigation, one must seriously question their believability no matter how many of them came forward. Dorsey crusaded further 
with the trial of the people of the state of Georgia versus Leo M. Frank. The trial began after a series of continuances on July 28, 1913. The first witness called to testify was Newt Lee, the man who discovered Fagan's body and whom police believed initially committed the murder. His story rarely changed to where the defense would question his sincerity and adherence to the truth. Mrs. J.W. Coleman was called to the witness stand, Mary Fagan's mother, to identify the clothing found on her daughter's body when Lee discovered her in the basement. Luther Rosser and Reuben Arnold, only two of the attorneys from Frank's eight-member defense team, sought to connect Lee with the murders. Upon cross-examination by the defense, Rosser made the argument that the police may have instructed Lee on what the alleged murder wrote in the murder notes found beside the body of Mary Fagan. Solicitor Dorsey stated at that point in the proceedings that the notes had not been entered into evidence yet and therefore Rosser did not lay the proper evidentiary foundation to question the witness about them. Rosser then declared, We've got to commence somewhere and at home sometime to show the Negro is a criminal and we might as well begin here as anywhere else. Luther Ray. Both of the legal teams seriously considered whether the word of a black witness against a white defendant may cause more trouble in the white South. After the exchange of barbs between the prosecution and the defense, the trial continued with no further effort on the defense's part to connect Lee to the murder. The bulk of the prosecution's plan was to focus on Frank's alleged sexual behavior with the female workers in the factory. The prosecution alleged that Frank, with Conley's assistance, often met women in his office to engage in sex. On the day of the murder, Conley testified that he saw a girl matching the description of Mary Fagan enter Frank's office in the afternoon, and shortly thereafter, heard a loud scream. A short time after that, Frank called Conley to his office and showed him Fagan's body, claiming that he hurt her, but he didn't mean to. Conley repeated a lot of what he put into his affidavits that he and Frank took Fagan's body to the basement in the elevator, then returned to the elevator and sat in Frank's office where Frank allegedly dictated the murder notes to him. Defense attorneys cross-examined Conley for 16 hours over the course of three days, but could not shake his story. The defense also called a series of witnesses that testified they had never seen Frank flirt with the female workers at the factory and considered him to be a man of, quote, good character, end quote. By the end of the trial, in fact, over 24 witnesses testified that Frank acted as a gentleman around females at the factory. On August 18, 1913, Leo Frank finally took the stand in his own defense. Frank, at first, explained the operation of the business in his charge. He explained ledger books and appeared to be more bookish than a lustful male animal as the prosecution attempted to portray him to the jury. Frank gave the details of his movements on the day of the murder and steadfastly denied that he murdered Mary Fagan. Of course, Solicitor Dorsey brought forth witnesses that allegedly discounted Frank's version of events. On August 20, 1913, Final arguments began in the People vs. Leo Frank. Near the end of the closing argument by the prosecution, as if from a Hollywood script, Dorsey could not have timed his speech any better, as he instructed the jury to find the defendant guilty, 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 by the ringing of the 12 o'clock bells of a nearby Catholic church. The gallery and other spectators heard the dramatic soliloquy as Dorsey repeated the word 12 times to supreme dramatic effect. After almost four days of a closing argument, Solicitor Dorsey completed his statement. The case went to the jury in the afternoon of August 25th. The jury left the courtroom after receiving their instructions from Judge Leonard Roan at 1.40 p.m. Then reported around 4.37 p.m. they reached a verdict. Through a unanimous decision, the jury found Leo Max Frank guilty of the murder of Mary Fagan. Frank showed no emotion as the judge read the verdict. Immediately, Jewish groups across the nation protested that the reason for Frank's conviction stemmed from a virulent anti-Semitism plaguing the South. Efforts of Jewish groups all over the nation continued for a long time, but had no influence on the people, newspapers, or the judicial system. Immediately after the verdict, Defense Counsel Rosser filed a motion for a new trial. In the motion, Rosser cited mistakes made in procedural error 
as well as prejudice, stating that members of that body were intimidated by crowds outside of the courtroom at the time of the trial. Judge Roan denied the motion for new trial and stated to the opposing counsels, I have thought about this case more than any other I have tried. With all the thought I have put on this case, I am not thoroughly convinced that Frank is guilty or innocent. But I do not have to be convinced. The jury was convinced. There is no room to doubt that. Judge Leonard S. Roan, 1913. The murder of Mary Fagan, the investigation, and the trial to outside observers seemed to be conducted with the utmost of unprofessionalism, both in the character of the police and the media at the time. Until recently, before the murder, Atlanta did not have that many newspapers to report the news. But when William Randolph Hearst purchased the Georgian, he brought some of the star reporters from New York to staff the paper. It should be noted that Frank was judged guilty in the press before going to trial because of jingoism and, quote, yellow journalism, end quote, displayed by Hearst's reporters. One only has to remember that 15 years before, Hearst and Charles Pulitzer competed against each other for circulation in New York. In doing so, both publishers enhanced their publishing credentials with providing the public with entertainment rather than solid journalism. It is for this reason that the United States eventually declared war on Spain and engaged in a seven-month-long conflict all due to faulty reporting and the sense that the U.S. should engage in globalism. Hearst brought that same attitude in journalism to Atlanta. Additionally, as a result of the newspaper reporting, anti-Semitism grew rampant. This is not to say that it did not already exist in the South, especially Georgia at the time, but until the arrest of Leo Frank and the accusation that he committed murder, Jews in Atlanta got along with their Gentile neighbors like family. After the frank verdict, that sentiment saw itself thrown to the wayside and old prejudices surfaced. Tom Watson, a local politician and failed presidential candidate, fueled further hatred against Jews and influenced the public into believing that Frank truly was guilty of the murder of Mary Fagan. At every turn, the state shot down every issue the defense raised at this appeal. The Georgia Supreme Court rejected the appeal after hearing the arguments and on taking them up for consideration on November 14, 1914. Defense counsel Rosser and Arnold next sought to bring the case to the federal level. The case finally reached the U.S. Supreme Court. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes gave an opinion where he seriously doubted if the petitioner had due process of law, quote, because the trial taking place in the presence of a hostile demonstration and seemingly dangerous crowd, thought by the presiding judge to be ready for violence unless a verdict of guilty was rendered." End quote. On April 19, 1915, the U.S. Supreme Court denied the appeal by a vote of 7-2. The dissenting justices encouraged the defense team to file a motion of habeas corpus stating that Frank had been denied due process because of the threat of crowd violence if Frank were judged innocent. The application for commutation of sentence then went to Governor John Slayton. The people of Georgia elected Slayton in 1912, and his term would end just four days after Frank's scheduled execution. Before the murder of Mary Fagan, Slayton agreed to merge his law firm with that of Luther Rosser, Frank's defense attorney, and the prosecution contended that this presented a conflict of interest. Governor Slayton took Frank's appeal and opened hearings of the case to reevaluate it. Tom Watson denigrated Slayton for rehearing a case that had already made its way through the court system. Slayton examined over 10,000 documents, visited the crime scene, and examined new evidence mistake. Governor Slayton suffered death threats and even a warning from the former governor of the state, Joseph Brown, who exclaimed to Slayton that if he wanted to bring back lynch law and destroy trial by jury, retry the Frank case. Watson sent a, quote, messenger, end quote, to Slayton that if he allowed Frank to hang, he could count on a, quote, friend, end quote, and holding office as a United States Senator could be in Slayton's future. Slayton reviewed the evidence and wrote a 29-page report. The governor criticized the press, especially those papers in the North, and other, quote, outsiders, end quote, and concentrated on the, quote, inconsistencies, end quote, in Conley's testimony and statements. According to the report, 
Governor Slayton stated two factors stood out, the transporting of the body to the basement and the murder notes found next to the murdered girl's body. When Conley was initially examined, investigators observed the feces at the bottom of the elevator shaft, which Conley stated he left there before the murder. Police and other investigators used the ladder to make their way to the crime scene and not the elevator. The first time the elevator was used again was the Monday after the murder when Frank and the detectives visited the crime scene and crushed the excrement. This detail demonstrated to Governor Slayton that Conley's rendition of using the elevator was incorrect and somewhat perjurous and therefore cast doubt of Conley's recollections of the events of the day of the murder. William Banning Smith, Conley's attorney, had questions about the murder notes and did an analysis. Smith and his wife, a former English teacher, analyzed Conley's writings with an emphasis on speech patterns, writing patterns, spelling, grammar, repetition of adjectives, and favorite verb forms. It appeared, according to Smith, that Frank did not coerce Conley to write the notes, but that Conley wrote them of his own volition. Smith produced a hundred-page report for the defense to use at the appeal before Governor Slayton. Furthermore, an affidavit from a former employee who left the company in 1912 stated that the notepads were sent to the basement to be burned, but no one ever got around to the task. The notes were not written in Frank's office, but in the basement. Governor Slayton's analysis of the evidence demonstrated that reasonable doubt existed as to Frank's guilt. Slayton also reviewed the wounds on the victim. He reasoned that Fagan's head wound certainly bled profusely, but no blood was found on the elevator or near the lathe nearby on the ground. Fagan's nostrils and mouth were filled with dirt that could have only come from the basement. Governor Slayton also stated that Conley's story of being a watchman for the factory manager during the alleged rendezvous with some of the factory females was suspect. Under Conley's story, Mary Fagan's virginal reputation would be at stake, and Governor Slayton stated that this would not be entertained. On June 21, 1915, Governor Slayton released an order commuting Frank's sentence to life imprisonment. The governor made it known that new evidence surfaced not available at the time of the trial, and Governor Slayton gave a press release that implored the people of Georgia to use restraint. All I ask is that the people of Georgia read my statement and consider calmly the reasons I have given for commuting Leo Frank's sentence. Feeling as I do about the case, I would be a murderer if I allowed that man to hang. I would rather be plowing in a field than to feel for the rest of my life that I have that man's blood on my hands. Governor John Slayton 1915. Before announcing the commutation, Governor Slayton, realizing that his sentence would bring outrage amongst those citizens convinced of Frank's guilt, ordered that Frank be transferred from the Atlanta jail to the Milledgeville State Penitentiary in the middle of the night so that angered crowds would not seek extra-legal justice in a major metropolitan city. When Frank arrived at Milledgeville, another inmate, William Crean, tried to slash Frank's throat with a seven-inch butcher knife, severing his jugular vein. Crean later stated to law enforcement that, quote, Frank's presence was a disgrace to the prison, end quote, and, quote, he wanted to keep the inmates safe from any mob violence that may occur as a result of Frank being in Milledgeville, end quote. Crean also hoped that he would receive a pardon for the crimes that he committed if he murdered Frank. Governor Slayton and his wife received death threats and the National Guard had to be summoned in order to preserve some semblance of order after the commutation announcement. Some residents of the state even burned the governor in effigy. Soon after the death of Mary Fagan, an organization formed in Marietta, Georgia, Mary Fagan's birthplace, much along the lines of the Ku Klux Klan, quote, the Knights of Mary Fagan, end quote. This group contained various members of Marietta hierarchy including judges, former police chiefs, and former sheriffs. These, quote, knights, end quote, as they were calling themselves, soon gathered in Marietta, Georgia, to plan a most diabolical act. In the afternoon of August 16, 1915, eight automobiles left Marietta, Georgia, and made their way to Milledgeville State Penitentiary. 
The trip took them almost seven hours, moving at a speed of almost 18 miles per hour. They arrived well after dark within the city limits and then made their way to the penitentiary. Without causing a stir or injuring any of the guards, the quote, knights, end quote, made their way into the prison and kidnapped Leo Frank. The group of eight cars lumbered their way back to Marietta, and on the way, Frank took his wedding ring off his finger and handed it to the man guarding him. Frank then asked the man to make sure his wife would receive it. Without saying a word, the man acknowledged to Frank that his wish would be granted. Once the convoy arrived in a little oak grove outside of Marietta, Georgia, crossed the street from where Mary Fagan was born at approximately 7 a.m., the men escorted Frank from the car, tied his legs and ankles together, and placed him upon a small table. Rumor had it that one of the executioners informed Frank that they were only carrying out the sentence of the court. One of the executioners placed a blindfold over Frank's eyes, then climbed down from the table. A noose was placed around Frank's neck, then that executioner climbed down from the table. All at once, one of the men standing behind the table kicked it from under Frank. In a few minutes, Frank's dead body dangled from the tree branch. The ring arrived at Mrs. Frank's residence two days later. As Frank's body hung in the tree outside of Marietta, Georgia, throngs of men, women, and children gathered around the body. Some came to the location to gather souvenirs of the murder and this place in history. Some of the observers of the day wanted the body cut into pieces and burned. The individual that advocated this horrendous action, Robert E. Lee Howell, then tried to agitate the crowd into performing his wishes. A local judge, Newt Morris, re-established order and ordered Frank's body cut down. When the body fell to the ground, Howell stamped Frank's face and chest. Morris had the man restrained and had the body placed in a casket and driven into Marietta. Once Frank's body reached Atlanta, thousands of citizens stormed the funeral parlor where his body lay and demanded to see the body. Some of the onlookers threw rocks through the windows until the parlor owner relented and allowed the denizens to enter peacefully. The next day, Lucille Frank escorted Leo Frank's body by rail from Atlanta to New York City, where relatives laid Frank to rest in Mount Carmel Cemetery in Glendale, Queens, New York, on August 20, 1915. After the lynching, Jews in Atlanta left the city in a hurry. Many who remained assimilated into Southern culture further and denied Judaism. Tom Watson exclaimed in his newspaper, The Jeffersonian, quote, The voice of the people is the voice of God, end quote. A grand jury assembled in Marietta, Georgia to discover anyone who would come forward to point the finger at the executioners. The new governor, Nate Harris, who succeeded John Slayton, offered a $1,500 reward for information leading to the capture of the lynchers. No one stepped forward. It was later discovered that most of Marietta's elite were responsible for executing Leo Frank, including judges, sheriffs, and police officers no one was ever brought to justice. In 1982, Alonzo Mann, who had been Frank's office boy at the time of Fagan's murder, and testified at trial that he saw Conley there serving as a lookout for Frank, finally came forward and stated that he witnessed Conley alone shortly after noon carrying Fagan's body through the lobby toward the ladder descending into the basement. Mann's story was substantiated through a polygraph test. And although polygraph tests are not reliable testimony in a court of law, the Anti-Defamation League used this evidence to request a pardon for Frank in 1983. Unfortunately, the Georgia State Board of Pardons rejected the pardon request by stating, quote, After exhaustive review and many hours of deliberation, 
it is impossible to decide conclusively the guilt or innocence of Leo M. Frank, end quote. However, on a second attempt in 1986, the state of Georgia granted a pardon, but with some conditions where they would not admit Frank's guilt or innocence, but rather that the state failed to protect Leo Frank or bring his killers to justice. More recently, in 2019, Fulton County District Attorney Paul Howard organized the Conviction Integrity Unit, specifically organized to re-examine the cases of Leo Frank and Wayne Williams, the convicted Atlanta child murderer. This unit will re-examine the evidence and make recommendations as to whether the cases will be re-adjudicated. The murder of Mary Fagan, the trial of Leo Frank, and his subsequent lynching have left an indelible mark on the American justice system. Although through history we see several miscarriages of justice, the Leo Frank case became an historical marker of sorts, a new beginning to an old tradition, one that remains a scourge in American history. After the lynching, Tom Watson, who was an agitator that tried to convince the public that Leo Frank was guilty, railed for the revival of an organization that protected white chivalry and placed white Southern women on a pedestal like that during the Reconstruction period of Southern history. On November 25, 1915, a group of men led by William Joseph Simmons used the memory of Mary Fagan and announced the reorganization of the Ku Klux Klan at Stone Mountain. Mary Fagan Keen, the great niece of Mary Fagan, penned a book entitled The Murder of Mary Fagan, a true story by Mary Fagan Keen. Miss Keen draws a lot on family history and only repeats what other histories have stated. Of the few books on the subject, Credible sources produced about the murder, trial, and subsequent lynching were documented fairly in Leonard Dinnerstein's The Leo Frank Case and Steve Oney's And the Dead Shall Rise. In recent history, the Leo Frank case has been the subject of television shows, TV movies, and even a Broadway musical. In 1964, on the series Profiles in Courage, Walter Matthau appeared as Governor John Slayton and Michael Constantine as Tom Watson. NBC produced a two-part miniseries called The Murder of Mary Fagan. Jack Lemmon played John Slayton, and a young Kevin Spacey played a reporter. In 1998, the Broadway musical Parade debuted. In 2009, Ben Loderman produced the documentary drama The People vs. Leo Frank. Until next time. True Crime Man's Dark Imagination is proud to announce that we are now on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash true crime MDI. Please become one of our patrons and enjoy future benefits of being an historical crime aficionado. Also, we are located at Twitter at HistoryGuy63 and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash history guy forward slash. If you like the presentation, please press like and subscribe. It would really help us out. And tell your friends about us as well.